The paper begins with the literature review on collective memory and international relations. First of all, the author defines memory as something that is socially constructed, which means that individuals do not hold memories physiologically. In terms of its relations with politics, the author finds that previous literature focused on domestic politics and they suggest that collective memory provides a source of legitimacy to political units. It also fosters domestic peace, stability, and a common national identity. Therefore, it is argued that previous literature overlooked the importance of collective memory for foreign policy gain, which is different from reality. The author argues that states actively pursue international goals employing collective memory. In the next section, the author introduces her new theoretical model called the diplomacy of memory. This model basically explains how countries behave on the international stage with the collective memory of their past for future foreign policy gain. The author conceptualizes collective memory as a diplomatic tool by arguing that official memory targets an international audience, not the domestic audience. In order to build a new theoretical model, the author borrows the two concepts from the previous literature. The first one is about the emotional diplomacy, and the second one is about the signaling behavior of a state. Emotional diplomacy model argues that states can use the projection of emotions as their strategic tool. And in this paper, the author applies the idea of emotional performances to her model and names it as memorial performances. And it is also assumed that States make costly investment for the success of their strategic use of collective memory, which is often called as signaling in the rationalist IR literature. And then the author identifies diplomacy with memory. According to the traditional construction of national narratives, there are the notions of the victor and the defeated. Based on these ideas, the paper proposes two different courses of diplomatic action, which are guilty perpetrators and innocent victims. The guilty perpetrators admit guilt and moral responsibility for their past wrongdoings. They often send gestures of remorse, shame, and apologies. However, Innocent victims often deny moral responsibility for their past wrongdoings, but project notions of passivity and defenselessness. They avoid the signals of remorse, shame, and apologies, but aim to achieve recognition and compensation for their own suffering. In order to test the assumptions of the diplomacy of memory model, the author employs a case study focusing on the issue of reparation payment to the Israel in the early 1950s. She reviews the two countries having the terrible legacy of the Holocaust, which are West Germany and Austria. Even though people from the two countries served in high-ranking positions of the Nazi regime, they told a very different official story about their past to the international audience. In her first case study, the author argues that West Germany forged the diplomacy of guilt. The Chancellor of West Germany acknowledged condemnation of the Nazi crimes. He delivered a speech in front of the international audience and emphasized that unspeakable crimes were committed in the name of the German people. Their substantive foreign policy actions can be regarded as a costly investment into guilt. For example, West Germany agreed to accept 1.5 billion US dollar 
as a basis for negotiation. For the rational purpose of the country's reintegration into the world community and Western alliance, they took on the significant material cost when they signed the agreement. In the case of Austria, we can find some evidence of diplomacy of innocence. Austria portrayed them as the first victim of Nazi Germany, and their public memories formed around their own victimization rather than the Jewish Holocaust. In terms of their substantive foreign policy behavior, they made credit agreement instead of reparations. The credit agreement was a clever choice to deepen their bilateral relations with Israel without paying reparations. Their strategic foreign policy goal was to maintain independence because innocent Austria could secure their place as a neutral state between the fault lines of East and West. In addition to the cases examined here, the author argues that there are many countries actually actively making diplomacy with memory on the international stage. I believe finding evidence for the new theoretical framework of diplomacy of memory in other historical cases and theorizing its variants can be interesting for the future researchers.